We have with us today Dr. Homi K. Bhava, scholar, author, and currently the Anne Rothenberg Professor of Humanities at Harvard University. Homi Bhava's works have explored post-colonial theory, cultural change, power, contemporary art, and cosmopolitanism. He is one of the most influential voices in the field of cultural studies and was recently made a fellow of the prestigious British Academy. Bombay born Homi Baba got his PhD at Oxford University and has taught in several universities around the world. Welcome to the wire, Homi K. Baba. My pleasure. Always good to see you. Always good to read the wire. Thank you. So, till just about a year or so ago, if one wanted to interview somebody, one had to find a way to meet face to face. I mean, in the same city or same country, sometimes it was not possible and abroad, definitely not. And here we are, oceans apart, comfortably chatting on video. Uh, humanity has learned to make adjustments rather quickly. Wouldn't you say? Yes. And there is now a whole culture of Zoom conversations, Zoom conferences, Zoom clothing is also now one of the fashion prerogatives. Um, yes, I think we have adapted. Um, I think we've adapted in interesting ways. I have found that Zoom keynotes should not be longer than 20 minutes. Normally, I would speak for 50 minutes. <clears throat> then Zoom conversations have taken on both a lively and a weighty tone. Um, and I think people are quite rightly very attentive to the medium. I think the medium has changed a great deal, uh, the way in which we want to communicate. But I have to say the thrill of meeting person to person, hugging, not maintaining social distance, not having a mask, going out for a drink after your conversation, having a live interaction with, uh, with your audience rather than piling up uh, chat box questions which you can never finally get to. These are the deficits of the current situation. And we do the best we can. We have to survive this and we have to be creative. So speaking of adjustments and uh, adapting, adapting to new things, People in many countries around the world have also had to come to terms with new iterations of democracy, where all the institutions and processes that make a democracy are in place, but the leaders who get elected are populist in the extreme and find ways to subvert it with different shades of authoritarianism. I don't know what to call it, perhaps perverted democracy or hybrid democracy, I don't know. So you've done a lot of work on this. You've thought about this. How do we see the world in these terms today? Democracies, but run by very, very quasi-dictatorial leaders. Yes. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. I see it as a symptom of the fragility and good faith without which the idea of democracy cannot simply be protected by its institutions. There has to be a sense of good faith and there has to be some sense of common purpose. And I think common purpose, the common good, is what a number of thinkers recently have said simply fails to exist. It's as if both teams of political parties want to play the political game entirely for their advantage. They want to kick the goals, but they don't want to have any rules of the game. And that is a profoundly disturbing issue. Now, I think the problem with this is the democratic uh, common good, uh, the concept of common, the common good in democracy is not something that is there waiting to be discovered. It is a part of the process. 
It is a part of the process of having free discussions. It is the part of the process of being able, a system, a political system, a cultural system, to be able to think about dissent and deal and negotiate with this dissent, not simply negate it. Today, we have too much negation, too little negotiation. And when we think, therefore, that the common good is not waiting to be discovered because we're human or because we have universal values, universal values in any particular context don't become de-universalized. People work for their own interests. Sometimes it's enlightened self-interest. Sometimes it's unenlightened self-interest. But if all the processes by which we discover and negotiate the common good, if that fails as it has in our society, then you begin to have this fearsome contradiction <clears throat> where the very institutions of democratic daily life and practice, the notion of the regular voting uh, 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 cycle every four years or every five years, which is in a way the way in which the people bid for a common good or try and build a common good, one person, one vote or electoral college, there are different systems, first past the post. Those institutional practices still were on like the wheels of democracy, but the engine of democracy is now being steered by ethno-nationalist populist leaders. And I think this shows us that the failure of democracy is not simply at the political level. It is at the ethical level, it's a cultural level, and most importantly, it's at the level of education. Our education has become so specialized into different areas. It is so dominated by technocratic and commercial interests that some broadly based civic education, education for citizenship, in an imaginative and interventionist way, really no longer exists. You want to be an excellent engineer, you want to be a leading political uh, operative, you want to be a very successful business person, but what is the network? What are the integuments? What are the bridges that ties that together? That I think is, is deeply missing. And so that's what is frightening to me, <clears throat> is the following. In 1971, I think it was, the French philosopher Michel Foucault was asked what he thought about globalization. And on that, at that, on that occasion, he said, <clears throat> do we have a form of economic globalization he said, yes, we can see economic global ties. Do we have a form of political globalization? Um, or, so, uh, yes, and he said, no, sorry, let me get this right. Do we have an economic globalization? Yes. Do we have a, a form of, of a, a financial globalization? Yes. Then he says, but do we have a form of global political consciousness? And he said, no way. Now, the frightening thing today, as these regimes, these ethno or tribal political regimes that stretch from the United States to Brazil, to India, to Pakistan, to Turkey, to Hungary, <clears throat> Poland, has really created a form of governance that is global. Each of these leaders, I should not forget, of course, China and Russia, each of these leaders feed off each other, they support each other ideologically and even institutionally. And so we have to say to Monsieur Foucault, now in 2020, there is at least at the level of leadership and at the level of large numbers of people in each of these 
nations which have this kind of ethno-nationalist uh, leadership, there is a global political consciousness and it is not one that furthers the causes of democracy. So, which brings us to the point, because you spoke at, at the level of leaders, each of the ones you've named has more or less, because we don't know what's happening in China on this front, has more or less got huge support. Uh, you had uh, in India, uh, Prime Minister Modi continues to enjoy support. We don't have very reliable um, uh, surveys, but it's quite clear that he has a lot of support. In uh, the United States, uh, President Trump uh, has lost but got the highest number of votes for a Republican candidate. So while this network of leaders may have emerged, they seem to have carried a lot of people along. Yes, absolutely, Siddharth, because if they had not carried a lot of people with them, they would not be in power and we would not be discussing your opening question about the contradictory fragility of democracy. It is because they have an appeal, because they have carried people with them, that we, we are in this situation. Uh, these are not, just to emphasize what you said before, these are not simply dictatorial regimes where the army has put these people in power, as you have had in many other places, where the people don't matter. The people have voted for these regimes. Now, I think there are, let me try and give you a couple of reasons why I think this is the case. <clears throat> I think that the public imagination is so caught in this kind of two-party nation idea. Either Democrat or Republican. More or less in India too, at the national level, BJP or Congress. We are so caught in this binary political method where there are two parties that it almost becomes difficult to think of a third political space. And by a third political space, I'm not only talking about a third party, talking about a non-binary, not two-party, not, not a polarized situation, but a more creative situation. Yes, there are times in Germany where the Green Party has <coughs> played a certain role, but to be in a kind of, how can I put it, a transformative middle or third position becomes very unstable if the real contenders are only two parties. And therefore, not in all conditions that you mentioned, but in many of them, you have the following situation for various reasons which we could go into. One of those two parties loses its base and loses its appeal and loses its, its leadership position. And then the imbalance <clears throat> becomes terrible. And I think people often in their anxiety vote for what they think is the stronger alternative. But the stronger alternative can also be potentially the undemocratic alternative. I think many of the votes cast for Trump, and there is no question that we have to give it to him that he brought out more people in the popular vote than any other uh, Republican leader. Many of them, I think, were fealty votes, votes of loyalty to the party. But even then, see how the people have spoken, in the United States at least. They have created an almost impossible situation if the Georgia polls are to be believed, where the Senate will still be Republican and you will have a Democratic leader. Now, this is the people saying we are strangled. We need something else. Our political imaginations and our political identifications need a, a, a different way. If we don't have it, we will create this logjam. And yesterday I, I heard the first uh, Biden-Harris 
debate on CNN, which you might have heard too. And almost as a response to every question of Jake Tapper's, both the president-elect and the vice president-elect had to repeat the mantra, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy because each question posed by him about public welfare, public health, in the economic policy was posed on this impossible crux between having the representative house in one political party and the leadership in another. Every question emerged from that stranglehold. But the people are trying to say something through that. They are also saying perhaps the electoral college no, is no longer the way in which we want to be represented. In India, <clears throat> you know so much better than I, but I cannot understand what it is that keeps the Congress party from reconstituting itself in a powerful way, not only mudslinging at the BJP, but actually creating an alternative platform, learning from its mistakes, learning from the fact that it has really not been able to enact the power of its history, the power of its, uh, of, 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 of its leaders for a long time. So I think people, when they are caught in this situation, either back, as I said, what seems to them as the strong workable alternative. I think the ideological commitment is possibly not as strong as the pragmatic decision, which is why the situation can be changed. And I think in the United States, on the other hand, people are saying, we are at a crossroads. What do we do? You, I'll just go back because there's something you said halfway through from where you then developed this. You used the word anxiety and actually that fits in very well with what I was going to say. In fact, with what you have been talking about, that one of the uh, strengths, are, if one may call it that, one of the tactics of these uh, uh, so-called strongman leaders is to constantly keep the populace in a state of anxiety and unpreparedness. So uh, like you have pointed out elsewhere, uh, I think in our discussion that, you know, you give four or five hours notice to shut down an entire country. Uh, you basically tell them demonetization was a classic example. I know I'm giving Indian examples. I'm sure there are- oh, there, Very much in my mind. So, so mm. you, you've written a lot. You've been developing this idea about unpreparedness. And uh, this keeping the population, the citizenry, on a constant stage, in a constant stage of tension, seems to be another common tactic. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it draws our attention to something very crucial, Siddha. And this may sound a little abstract. But current history does not allow us to simply deal only with the day-to-day -day pragmatic issues. We have to stand back and look at some of the larger patterns and think about what you said to me. People were given four hours to de-densify cities in India when COVID happened. In Nigeria, I was just reading there have been raids around against the people who've been given three hours or four hours to make a decision. In China, people did not reveal coronavirus for two weeks. In America, despite the fact that the cabinet had been warned that this was an emergency, it was kept under wraps, more or less, with dismissive remarks for about five weeks. Now, what is what repeats in these examples that you've given and that I've given? It is a notion of political time making and decision making that is shrinking. Usually we thought about five year plans, usually annual budgets. Now, what I call 
the governance of the unprepared is being executed in short spurts of time where undemocratic uh, and 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 uh, they may not they are undemocratic in terms of the spirit of democracy there is no necessary violation of a law but it's normatively ethically completely unreliable <clears throat> and it creates so these short spurts of time decisions are made monetization is another one in india people are not warned and the boast is only for people new <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry overnight that we were going to make this decision this is the boast let's read this for a moment why has the time of governance shrunk so that populations are kept in a spirit of anxiety as they move from one short spurt to another and in that anxiety is being produced what i call the unprepared citizen why is this so beneficial it's beneficial because the power elite can shrink even the more basic democratic issues of discussion or public with consultation with public health officials taking a considered and reflective view which involves discussion democratic discussion dialogue all that is is thrown by the way in the short spurts of time these decisions two things happen one our ethno nationalist leaders establish their sovereign power almost like the power of of of, of royal powers and kings not of the not of the deliberative participatory notion of dem democratic leaders they actually demonstrate in short periods of time their power they can actually turn the tide of events immediately at their will that's one thing. secondly because the people are not in prepared because they are taken unprepared their own sense of agency whether it's right or left whether it's democratic or whether it's bjp or congress their own sense of agency as democratic citizens is thwarted and they lose confidence in it that's where the anxiety comes in what am i to do i can't do anything about it this is what is handed down to me all i've got to do is to scramble to survive and when you scramble to survive you also create the impression that people can cope with these 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 forms of governance that are so often tyrannical short sighted so you don't then have the public fora of protest or the public fora of protest has shrunk to some extent so unless you have a black lives matter movement here and i know there are equivalent movements in india and unless those movements can be supported by the press whether it's in social media or whether it's the more traditional press then it becomes very difficult for the citizenry to say why are we being treated this way all the citizenry can do is to survive we knew that people died in queues outside banks due to demonetization and yet many people predicted that this would create a real political crisis for the bjp as we understand there were lots of complaints there was a lot of hand wringing but it didn't destabilize the party so there is there is this kind of sovereignty um uh, uh, belonging to a very different political system the the sovereign leader on the one hand depending on the survival instincts of a people who are going to try and survive one way or another and the survival the people who survive do not have the freedom often a protest and organized protest so they can erupt here and there you have the arab spring very important and then the arab winter follows the arab spring and then you have black lives matter which is making a huge indentation and we hope that it will continue that uh, but so unless you have those sorts of supports which you will only have 
in a democratic system where negotiation and not negation, where enablement and not erasure of the people's power and the people's freedom is available, and the freedom of the press absolutely central, we are going to be caught in a real Gordian knot, uh, as indeed we are. Yet, uh, these leaders who managed to get their way there, who've got a massive political backing, who have barely any opposition, which is spirited enough or um, strategic enough to, um, uh, to come up with its own uh, you know, political campaign, yet they have turned out to be uh, extremely inefficient because their handling of COVID or the aftermath of demo demonetization, COVID in the U US has been a disaster. Uh, the handling of the pandemic. And even in here, I'm sure in other countries, Brazil is a good example. So with all that, they're still inefficient. Of course they're inefficient. But what? why should they aspire not to be inefficient if they have already in different ways tried to silence the press, silence dissent, uh, turned uh, the main people live in a survivalist mode and people have to survive, so they continue to live. They've got to make their lives. Why should they be efficient? For whom should they be efficient? I mean, you know, initially, we've, we're used to using the phrase that Hitler made the trains run on time, or Mussolini made, you know, very important and effective changes in certain kinds of agricultural policy, particularly in, in, the, in, the, in Tuscany. So there was a time when we felt that these dictatorial leaders worked for a certain kind of ruthless efficiency. Ruthless is the word. But that's not the case now. I think that now, uh, why would you want to be efficient when you, on the one hand, narrowed your whole leadership group to some very, very narrowed, almost a group of people where you, where the people themselves are in a situation of disempowerment. The press is continually attacked. Who, and the system you have in one country is being echoed and represented right around the world. These are masculinist leaders. That's the other thing that surprises you. They're all men across the world now. There are very few. New Zealand, yes. Germany, yes. And you can see how those two leaders stand out from the rest. So it seems to me, what are they to be efficient about at the moment? Why should they be? They don't recognize the unprepared citizen as, as a form of citizenship which needs to be more prepared. Their erratic and, and, and often tyrannical governance depends upon this. So that clearly means that the people have voted for them. And therefore, one has to just say this is the will of the people in a very uh, straightforward election. And then we, therefore, it has to be accepted. Or should we then look for ways to address these Anomalies that after anomalies that they after they're um, elected, that there are ways to uh, ensure that they don't get carried away. I mean, do we need more checks and balances, or we just say four years in India's case, six years in Erdogan's case, many more? You just have to accept it. No, I think people will not accept it <coughs> um, uh, at some point, and people do not accept it. And that's why you have uh, the, the protest movements. That's why you have certain resistant movements, which now gain their strength internationally because they're beaten up nationally. Uh, the prospects for some major transformations are difficult to see, but there are signs of this kind of, uh, of, of possible transformations. For instance, as you were talking, I was thinking that a democratic process took place in the United States. <coughs> the person who <coughs> cannot accept it 
is the president. The president cannot accept it. The attorney general who has done the president's bidding, who's the president's lackey, many people think Mitch McConnell and Barr, attorney general Barr, have played a remarkably suspect role in all this, really damning the democratic process. They are not Mitch McConnell so much, but Barr has come out only yesterday saying, you know, there has been absolutely no malfeasance. There's been no, um, uh, we, we, cannot, we cannot fault the election. The only person who can't accept it and is therefore able to carry with him a large number of people who I saw interviewed yesterday has been, the, uh, has been Trump himself. So that raises a further question for us, Siddharth, which is, what is the attraction of these leaders? We critique them from our perspective. We critique them. Uh, we enter into a process of detraction uh, for, for good reasons. But what is the attraction? And not what is the attraction <clears throat> simply of the strong man, but what is the attraction of a form of governance that depends so much on rumors, false information, the denial of facts, and the way in which that gives support to certain things that we might call fantasies. Que anon in, 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 in America, uh, you know, that, that perpetrates these um, uh, these false uh, theories of a kind of extravagant kind. The fact that Democrats are supposed to be involved in, uh, in, in, in an international plot to do with uh, a child abuse. The fact that Venezuela was involved in, in, in the election results. Look, these are so far-fetched that we have to enter into the realm of psychology. What is it that makes these people so profoundly invested in fantasy? Is it the fact that many, that, that television now has made a genre of these kind of futuristic um, uh, uh, science fiction type uh, uh, programs is, is that the formative uh, situation that allows people to have these fantasies within the world of what we call political rationality or public reason so let us not always simply critique let us also begin to understand how these regimes are symptoms of some deep cultural emotional um, uh, states, of, states of mind and states of being. That's why I think that an appropriate future conversation between us should be titled On Public Madness. But um, part of that fantasy uh, which you mentioned uh, is not merely a here and now political fantasy, it's also the fantastical uh, myth-making of historic memory, of uh, memories of something that never may have existed, making America great again, pre-Mughal India when everything was the golden period of uh, pre-Mughal India, um, you know, Turkey, it's uh, harking back to the Ottoman Empire, perhaps yeah. even before. I don't know whether you've read about that Turkish serial, which is the article, which is all about the uh, uh, the Ottoman Empire. Here we are re-showing the Ramayana. So, so this entire thing is not merely predicated on oh, the Democrats uh, are raising this specter of uh, COVID. It's not merely that, or COVID is just a manufactured thing. It's, it's, but it's about 
this drawing of this picture and making america great again is clearly about an america where everyone knew their place and the white reign supreme i mean part of that so it is the similarities are uncanny because everyone seems to be saying similar things absolutely but let's think about this a very important point i was emphasizing the way in which now through the unregulated domain or the unregulated market of social media where anybody can post anything there are groups uh, you can you 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 can actually um uh, create a kind of opinion group without necessarily having to go out into the street and do it or you can or you can sit at home and belong to these things i'm suggesting that that medium has also to be understood together with the large emphasis on fantasy in television product in television content there's a huge amount of fantasy so i emphasize the current issue the current culture world if you like and you talk about the fact that these earlier atavistic memories the earlier traditionalist ideas of states of history that maybe had never existed have their own fantasy and they are somehow imported into the present moment so one way of understanding that is to think about it as if there is a kind of yearning for a pure past or a past of purity and you and as you put it quite rightly a past where everybody knew their place where no dalit aspired to anything where no post slave american citizen and i think that's the way to put it ever aspired to breaking through from the jim crow ideas and knew his or her place in in society and lived within the incarceration of race of course i'm sure that that is one aspect of this but there there is another aspect to this and that other aspect links i think and i would like to suggest with the issue that you brought up and i elaborated about the way in which the current political atmosphere the current political media has to do with the short undemocratic acts of our leaders i think what both these things the long memory that is being brought now to persecute to discriminate to create racialism to create hindutva the show you know these acts in by which these ideologies they may be long ideologies sidart but the acts by which they're most dramatically dramatically and i use that word imposed are the short acts and the short performances of power right relatively short and i think that in that context people's notion of of participation political participation has also become deeply problematic because it's almost as if if i can think myself through que anon and its various theories today it does not materially affect my life in terms of my food or my the air i breathe but what it allows me to do is to hold on to some realm of often redemptive fantasy it's a redemptive fantasy it that fantasy comes out of anxiety that fantasy comes out of trying to get out of your current situation so i think if there is hope here it will lie in the fact of people understanding over time as i think they have understood in the united states in a small measure that these redemptive fantasies don't actually work in the interests of the people as soon as there is a crisis a pandemic economic crisis they just don't deliver but the redemptive must not only be seen as an act of power on the people it is in my view an act of an anxious unprepared un nurtured national citizen so this black lives matter uh, people coming out in large numbers to vote 
and uh, you know giving the popular vote and the electoral college vote both here we are seeing right now a, a long struggle going on of the farmers who are protesting against uh, what they call is the takeover of agriculture by the corporates the ca protests and there are protests in a lot of other places it's it's is that is that the voice of the citizen because the political parties sometimes do not have the answers or the breakthrough solutions is the voice of the citizen bypassing traditional media for example and bypassing the political um, alternatives is making itself heard so therein lies the future um, trajectory i think so but of course as you describe the landscape these are all seeds of great hope <clears throat> um, how do we make them last do we make them last by creating a architecture which has to resemble the party system we have now which has manifestly failed in many respects as we have been discussing which is why you have this incredible imbalance or do we do we read from this situation that unfortunately we are in a situation whereby we don't know what new structures can be established institutionally to be able to uh, deal with our current situation i think that is one of the issues how do we integrate these energies and you know these energies are energies of movements and again since one of our issues has been not only political ideas but political time let me say that in the black lives matter movement the way in which black lives matter activists and academics and artists see the movement is in terms of the moment they call it the moment invariably they call it the moment now how do you make a moment last here i think we have we see something which is both problematic but also maybe productive steve bannon said a long time ago when he cheered um uh, trump on to go animal as he put it his phrase and when he said obama didn't understand what the people wanted they wanted more nationalism and we decided to go barbarian both this notion of go animal and go barbarian has been uttered by steve bannon unashamedly you know this was for him a political parlance democratic language but what he what he touched his finger on i think very accurately was to say the republican party can be more attentive to uh, to 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 ethnic minorities the democratic party can be more attentive to rust belt states doesn't matter we are not talking about republicans and we are not talking about democrats we're talking about a movement and i think that's a different thing so on the right they understand the power of the movement i think that people are talking about trump in 2024 or he's talking about it may happen may not happen but nobody is denying that a certain movement which is in itself not even necessarily parliamentary it may have some parliamentary deputies or it may have some senators or congress persons but there is a movement that is running like a pack parallel to the party system that we have that's on the right and in a way maybe the right have been able to pr produce a leader like trump or maybe in india a leader like modi in whom all the fantasies of the people the anxieties of the people are held i mean after all didn't mr modi say i have a what 64 inch chest and i will take all the beatings that you're given by the congress party and these socialists and these secularists i will take it on myself trump 
does that in a different way. Sometimes he draws attention to his beautiful hair, as he has said himself, and sees himself as this sort of burnished, I mean, this burnished, bronzed figure. And he's going to lead the movement. We don't have, I think, on the democratic left, the progressive democratic uh, left, or the progressive democratic position, let's call it that, liberal position, whatever you want, we have not projected we don't have a leader. It's depressing that you need a leader in order to think about movements on the left which actually critique precisely this kind of masculinist model of leadership. They say this is not how democratic parties work. But on the other hand, I think there will have to be, if not a leader, and I hope it certainly won't be a man, there will have to be some form of, uh, uh, of attentive and affiliative sense of belonging. And that belonging has to be broader, a broader church than your own particular interest group. That I think that's called, very important. In the old days, it was called internationalism. Internationalism. But of course, now it's globalization. <laughs> These globalized masculinist ethno-nationalist leaders have captured and indeed squandered the symbolic and the actual value of international uh, bodies. I mean, look at them uh, in the middle of a pandemic, uh, United States of America, which is a major player, draws out of the WHO. Where is the internationalism? The globalization is no longer in the hands of internationalists and internationalism is in the hand of, is, is being clobbered by the globalists. So I think that this, uh, this conversation is very important because we have pulled, we have, uh, we have really pulled our punches. I mean, we have really seen the difficulties we're up against. But on the other hand, the fact that there are still protest movements, the fact that we thought in the United States that lockdown was slowly going to come to an end. And then you had the 8.57 minutes, so 8.56 minutes of George Floyd's death. And in the main protesters with their masks on, but came out on the streets, just when we were thinking restaurants will open and theaters will open and we will have all these cultural entertainments political culture raised its head in a very significant way. And maybe it says something about the United States that the effect of that, such as the effect of Me Too, has been quite seismic. But on the other hand, there is another danger, Siddharth, that the concentration of this kind of leadership that we've been talking about, this global leadership, creates a situation where those citizens who we say are unprepared and anxious to, to carry on with the thread of our conversation, sometimes to defend themselves, also are hardened into the kind of identities just to preserve themselves. And then there is a kind of identitarianism of the more progressive elements, which I believe is a way to try and balance the group of leaders who are so synonymous one with each other, who resemble one with each other. And I think that's actually problematic because I think these ethno-nationalist leaders want minority groups to identify themselves in that way so that they can clobber them even better. They can identify them. So it's always hazardous to look at the future. And I think uh, philosophers and academics uh, tend to be a little wary. Journalists have no such compunctions. But I'm going to cross that bridge and say, how do you see it all unfold? I mean, that will be a nice way to kind of sum up these marvelous ideas that uh, have emerged today. How do you see it all unfold? Well. Siddharth, I take a line from the book I'm writing at the moment to say why I think your question is so important in talking about the future as we 
come towards the close of our current conversation. And it does again echo the notion of the time of governance, the time of our current politics, the, the time of the times in which we live in. Uh, and I have a line where it says, the past refuses to die and the future doesn't wait to be born in a punctual way. We are caught between those two forces, a past that has its own history and a future that keeps asking us, how are you going to act today so that in future, your actions will be seen as being emancipatory, involved with equality, freedom, and so on. We can take a very practical uh, response built on the current US elections. I think I said that the people have put the country in an impossible position. That doesn't resolve the problem. We will see how it all works out. We will see if there's any chance of bipartisanism. Of course, Biden has come in precisely because he's the master bipartisan politician and has proven himself in a different situation. But I think that the people have spoken by creating this difficulty for the people themselves. I think that's one way in which we can start thinking from a difficult position of certain kinds of reform. There'll be very challenging times, but when I say the, the American people have put the American nation in an impossible situation, I think this is the time where a number of things will have to be confronted. The question of the electoral college, the popular vote, that will have to be confronted at some time. What is the strength of a bipartisan system? Is it working? Is it not? These are fundamental issues about democracy. So I think there's going to be, as both Biden and Kamala Harris, at least for the United States, said, this is going to be no la-la land over the next four years. This is going to be difficult. But in confronting one's difficulty, I think there is what a German philosopher once called disappointed hope. When you work to deal with these problems, because you have to work to deal with them, that's what we are doing now. This has been no La La Land conversation, right? Uh, we've been desperately looking at some of the most difficult, intractable issues of the time, but we are doing it because we have hope. We're not doing it because we're in some kind of endless state of melancholy. We're not complaining. We're battering against these issues. So I think we will be in a phase of, let us call it, symptomatic recovery. We will look at the symptoms of our, uh, that our systems have thrown up, regrettable ways, and we will try and work with those symptoms to get to the causes. I think that's one of the ways in which the future, we will be employed in the future and any future conversations we may have, will have to also push along that side. <clears throat> I also think uh, that there is some comfort in the fact that um, <clears throat> we have had accidents of fate like the pandemic, accidents of fate like the pandemic, which will have long-term issues, long-term issues to do with our notion of what is success, long-term implications for what is a working life. In the wealthier countries, this may be more easeful. In the poorer countries, it will be a situation of immediately terrible anguish and terrible violation and terrible um, um, predicaments. But I think that there will be a correction and a readjustment through the pandemic, working practices, um, the, 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 the amount spent uh, on uh, entertainment in the, you know, the entertainment industry, we, we actually regret it. We regret the closing down of any business, etc. But we also have to think 
that uh, people could spend at one meal what it would take in India for a family to subsist on for a month. And I think that with the right kind of fiscal policies, a, a major correction could take place if social welfare comes back again. And I think some form of social welfare will have to come back again because otherwise countries will simply fail. And I think in the United States at least, and to some extent in England, that conversation has started. How do we now, how do we now boost the infrastructure of social welfare? Otherwise the whole country will collapse. So these kinds of infrastructural issues, uh, of course, I hear more of what's going on in the States. And one of the things that Biden has been banging on about is we need real infrastructural overhaul. We need an overhaul of the, of, of the health system. That clearly because of the pandemic issues. We need to rethink of policing. We need to rethink about the role of the coercive arms of the state in the context of the country. I don't know in India... Uh, where there is such a high tolerance amongst many people of just having to put one foot in front of the other and surviving day to day, I don't know whether those people at the current moment can put the kind of necessary pressure. But I feel always confident. And in a way, I always have a profound sense of disappointed hope in India because I think there are few countries and few people who actually push the causes that they represent against all the odds, against the odds. And I, and, I, and I think that that is another positive thing. But I think the readjustments now in the world, a world has been more or less shut down for almost a year. Uh, and it affects every bit of our lives. And think about this, uh, Siddharth that a public health crisis has made us think deeply about public welfare, mental health, social balances and equalities. So it has taken a life and death condition to make us think more generally about the common goods of political and social life. Isn't it biblical? Isn't it mythological Dude. that you have to think about mass? You have to think about the plague and you've got to think about mass death. And there is a kind of comparatively more people are dying than we ever thought was possible with our advanced sciences and our advanced medicines. It's almost as if some authority, some, let me call it, a divine secular authority, let me put it both ways, is now confronting us with this major challenge, which says rethink the ethics and the politics of public life and private life after this almost mythological condition of the pestilence. Thank you, Homi Baba. And uh, do listen to it from the beginning to the end. It's very detailed and it's a stimulating look from one of our leading uh, authorities on a cultural understanding of the world uh, of what is happening and why and how this has emerged. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.